and the state has various cleanup levels for various types of properties. So uh, if it's an industrial site, you only have to clean it up uh, to one level. But then if it's going to be a residential site, there's a, uh, a lower uh, or a higher bar. The soil has to be cleaner uh, for, the, for the DEQ to sign off on the property and acknowledge that you've remediated it. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network CREPN Radio. Episode number 164. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jade Aaron Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Let's get into the show. Today, my guest is Mike O'Connor. He is the president and principal geologist of Assessment Associates Incorporated. Uh, today we're going to speak with him about environmental assessments, what they are, when you need one, and why you would want one. Uh, but first, I want to remind you, if you like the show, please let us know. We would love to have you like, share, subscribe, and uh, leave a comment if you'd like to do that. I uh, also want to remind you that if you'd like to see how handsome our guests are, uh, you can check out our YouTube channel at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome my guest, Mike. Mike, welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks, Darren. Nice to be here. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, the uh, environmental risk that uh, real estate investors face is, is real, and uh, we've not yet covered it. Uh, but before we jump into to, uh, that conversation, if you could take a minute and share a little bit about your background uh, with our listeners. Well, sure. I uh, grew up in the East Coast and in Massachusetts and got my college degree in geology at UMass Amherst. I moved out to Oregon in 1988 and uh, worked for a solar company for a while, was very interested in that, and then started consulting about uh, 22 years ago and uh, started my own firm about 12 years ago in uh, 2006. Got it. And uh, I think, you know, the, the, um, the, the term environmental hazard or uh, there's a couple of pictures that come to mind in my, my brain. And, uh, you know, on the extreme, it's probably something like the, uh, the Gulf uh, oil spill or, you know, Three sure. Mile Island or something, something like that. Love Canal, yeah. Yeah, something that's uh, definitely newsworthy and, and uh, you know, national tragedy kind of thing. Um, I'm wondering, though, if, if that's the uh, – if maybe to start you could kind of describe what a, uh, a typical call from, from a client or, a, you know, a, a job might look like. Oh, sure. Yeah, the, the, the um, vast majority of our projects are uh, environmental uh, assessments, phase one environmental assessments, usually for a property transaction, and the threshold is usually a million dollars. And the lenders are usually driving the uh, or triggering the environmental assessment. And the whole reason is that uh, there are a lot of common um, uh, items or, or um, types of things that can happen to a property that can present an environmental concern or even a recognized environmental condition, as the uh, government refers to it. And that could be usually something like a gas station with the underground fuel storage or dry cleaner where they're store, storing solvents on site, uh, especially the older uh, properties that had dry cleaners back before they had more modern equipment, uh, and they would uh, tend to drip a lot more of those solvents right down onto the floor or dump the dirty solvent out, out the back uh, door, just out on the ground to make it go away. <clears throat> and uh, and most uh, cities, including Portland, uh, there's a lot of redevelopment happening in the urban areas. A lot of the uh, uh, old gas stations are being converted into um, different uses. And so a property that may have been sitting empty or unused for 20 years all of a sudden ha has uh, 
perceived value as a, a, a store or restaurant or something like that. And uh, in order to bring the property up to um, the modern standards of uh, environmental integrity, um, you might need to do some soil testing. Uh, but uh, just to um, describe what a phase one assessment is, it's everything but soil testing. So the first step is we do uh, an interview and uh, site walk and uh, uh, research on government um, databases and uh, permits and that kind of thing to see if there's anything that would lead us to believe there's a problem at the property. I may have over answered that question. But <laughs> no, no, I appreciate that because uh, I think yeah. it, it's easy to run past it like, oh, phase one. Uh, yeah. You know, and not know uh, uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm curious. Uh, a couple of sites I'm, I'm, that come to, to mind. Uh, you mentioned kind of an older, you know, historical use. Uh, I guess yep. is what I would would look at. Um, does the does the uh, uh, phase one? Do you, do you limit it to strictly the the property, or how much attention do you pay to neighboring uh, properties that? Um, I don't know. I guess their relationship between sure. between the property and and the neighbors, right? Well, especially when you're talking about groundwater contamination. Of course, it's uh, not bound by property uh, boundaries. So, if there is contamination, say if you have a property next door to a dry cleaner or a gas station or something, uh, it's very uh, potentially likely that it's been impacted by whatever contamination might have occurred on that property. And part of the phase one, section five, is a government database review. And there's a couple of dozen different government databases, both state and federal, that we review out to a one-mile radius. The worst of the worst is the Superfund sites that you've heard about before. They're the ones that the EPA has put on their national priority list. And those sites we research out to a mile from the property, and we... Um, Read a the, look through the file. Uh, a lot of times we can download information from the EPA's website, and then we'll read through it and decide if uh, it's close enough to be a concern. A mile is pretty far. There are situations where if groundwater gets contaminated and it's in a fast-flowing aquifer, it, it can actually move uh, over hundreds or thousands of feet. So I, I'd say uh, one mile is is usually um, not a concern, but it can be if we're talking about widespread groundwater contamination. Usually, um, 500 feet is probably um, as close as uh, a nearby property is going to impact your uh, subject property that you're researching. If it's soil contamination, it tends not to really be very mobile. But uh, there are properties, especially in uh, parts of Portland where groundwater is only a few feet deep. And so uh, it's not uncommon for contamination, especially if it's solvent contamination, to uh, cross property boundaries and flow hundreds of feet away. So usually I, a quarter mile is about the uh, radius of concern, 1,200 feet or so, that I um, put most of my focus. Uh, and then if a site is on that national priority list, I will read through the description of it to make sure that it's um, not one of the ones that have has actually impacted the, um, the deeper aquifers that are more mobile. You mentioned the nat- national list, um, and that was that Superfund list, was that? Mm-hmm. Okay, so national priority list. Yeah, that's actually the the top of the Superfund list. They have several different categories within that uh, within that Superfund uh, moniker, and the NPL or the national priority list are the ones that are the uh, the more, most severely contaminated and have the the biggest potential to uh, affect nearby receptors. So. So if somebody's looking at a property, say there's there's a, uh, I'm just thinking of uh, clients that uh, have bought like a, a site that used to be a gas station, yeah, and there's uh, clearly there were underground tanks at one time. Um, is there a way for them to do like a preliminary kind of a you know before they get to a submitting an offer, or is it basically go ahead and proceed as if and then subject to a phase one or 
Or is there, I mean, I guess I'm thinking if there was like a, a known problem, is there a list of sure. known, known problems to where you could just, you know, say no way or? Well, yeah, the, the uh, gas station is really interesting because uh, there are, if it's a site that hasn't had any tanks on it for, say, since the early 1990s, if they were, if they were taken out, uh, 1991, uh, August 31st, in fact, is when Oregon started requiring soil testing whenever a tank is removed from the ground. So prior to that time, there was a visual and olfactory requirement. So the contractor was supposed to uh, contact DEQ and make a report. DEQ is our state uh, environmental quality commission. Uh, a contractor was obligated to notify them of a petroleum leak or release if they smelled it or saw discolored soil. But uh, after the 1991 date, they actually mandated that soil samples have to be taken whenever a, a tank is being removed. So uh, if the tank has been pulled after that 1991 date or if the, the gas station was decommissioned or taken out of service, there's a good chance that there's actual records of uh, the um, tank decommissioning and the soil sampling. If it was prior, if the, if the site was shut down prior to that date, um, it's unusual that you'll see any kind of uh, environmental testing of the soil. So uh, in that case, uh, there's a couple different avenues that we recommend. We'll uh, suggest if there's if there's no records about whether the tanks were removed or not, and that's abs actually not very unusual, we'll recommend a geophysical survey, which uh, uses uh, ground penetrating radar and a magnetometer, uh, which is a fancy kind of metal detector, to uh, scan underground and look to see if the tanks are still there. And uh, even if we don't find any tanks, we can still use that ground penetrating radar to try to see uh, where the old tank pits were. A lot of times they'll be filled with a slightly different density material, say gravel instead of just sand or silt. And so we'll be able to get an idea of where the tanks were um, and at least be able to uh, put together a plan for where to do some drilling if we, if we feel like there's a chance there's contaminated soil. And in the case where the tanks were removed prior to 1991, uh, like I said, there's almost never any kind of uh, lab data or, or any testing that was done. So that's usually what we recommend is to uh, to take some soil sampling um, uh, at the in the the uh, area where the tanks used to be. So go down about 10 feet with a drill rig, and then they can actually bring up a soil core. And uh, we'll we'll uh, it comes up in a, a clear plastic tube from the drill rig and then they, the driller slices it open for you and you can actually um, look through the uh, soil from top to bottom of this hole and look for areas of discolored or uh, gasoline um, smelling soil. Uh, and, uh, and then what we would do is uh, take some of that soil, put it in a jar um, and send it to a lab to get a, a soil analysis of it. And the state has various cleanup levels for various types of properties. So uh, if it's an industrial site, you only have to clean it up uh, to one level. But then if it's going to be a residential site, there's a, uh, a lower uh, or a higher bar. The soil has to be cleaner uh, for, the, for the DEQ to sign off on the property and acknowledge that you've remediated it. Hey, I want to back up one second to the, sure. uh, the geophysical... Uh, that uh, kind of right. X-ray kind of machine you were talking yep. about, or whatever. <clears throat> so, would this still be pre uh, Phase Two? Is Phase Two mean that we're going into the ground? Is that? I mean, we're going to generally do the core samples. Yeah, Phase Two is considered if you're doing any kind of uh, physical sampling or uh, anything more than just research and uh, interviews. So. Um, from time to time, you'll you'll get a client that will want to, um, if they have an idea already that there are tanks on the property, they may ask you to include a geophysical survey in the phase one, and we'll just call it an expanded phase one. But yeah, technically, the geophysical survey, even though we're not actually grabbing physical samples, we're just doing imaging, um, it's considered phase two. Okay. Yeah, that, that was kind of curious about that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, you got me thinking here, uh, you know, especially with like the uh, residential properties. And I know uh, in Portland, uh, heating oil uh, tanks and, and heating oil oh, is yeah. kind of like a real popular uh, means of heat or yeah, fuel. Yeah. yeah. And so can you speak to, you know, what a, somebody buying a, a um, you know, multifamily property that, that uh, I guess it would be, Either there's not a record, or there is a record, or there's a. Yep. How, how would you be able to tell that there once was a, uh, you know, an oil tank and a tank? Yeah, and and how many times do you find also that maybe um, somebody removed it, nobody documented it, and and then I guess you're into that uh, your geophysical kind of thing there, but sure. Well, fortunately, Portland actually kept really good records for commercial and residential tanks uh going back to the early 1900s and they still have these little three by five cards with uh, the original writing hand very very nice cursive people had really good hand yeah i've right seen those and thank thank yeah. god that i wasn't uh the uh, handwriter yeah, right. the record I think people keeper put a lot more effort <laughs> into uh having good handwriting back then right but anyway so it's kind of fun looking through all those old records seeing you know, everyone's uh, great penmanship but um the, so there's um, – in Portland, there is a uh, office at for the city fire marshal uh, where they have a drawer full of these records. And uh, so you can either do it over the phone or you can just walk right in and they'll, they'll pull the – they'll look them up by address for you. They're filed by address, which is, is good because that's really the only way you can look them up. And then um, those are for the commercial uh, permits. And for some reason, they haven't put those online yet. Uh, I'm not sure why, because the residential permits have been put online. There's a, a website called Portland Maps, which is uh, our city's property GIS assessment uh, website. And if you pull up a property address there, you can click on the permits link, and then it'll tell you whether there's a, a tank permit for the property itself or uh, whether there's uh, – they'll usually – uh, list the five or six that are the closest. So if it's a na- neighbor next door or a few houses down, they'll usually put all those in there. I don't know what the radius is. It's probably a few hundred feet. So there is relatively good record keeping for that. The other thing that, uh, or the other way that you can make a determination on the likelihood of there being a tank associated with a multifamily Multifamily is kind of between commercial and residential. If it right. was an apartment building and it was a heating oil tank, they're probably in the, the uh, residential uh, tank permits. So we always just look at both databases for, for any property. Right. Uh, but uh, while when you're walking the property, uh, you can look for a few different uh, appurtenances that will uh, tell you whether or not there's a tank at the property. There, there could be vent pipes coming up the side of the building. Uh, and uh, now that I mentioned that, as you as you drive around, you, you may notice just these uh, inch and a half galvanized pipes going up the side of a building to the roof line. Or you'll also see uh, a pipe coming up maybe a foot from the ground with a, a cap on it. And those are the uh, fill pipe. So if you're on property and you see that the fill pipe coming up out of the ground or there's just kind of a cap and you can lift that up in the sidewalk and see that there's another cap underneath there, uh, usually that means there's still a tank there because they they would usually, they're supposed to anyway, take those uh, um, parts of the tank, the vent system and the fill system out when they take the tank as well. Now, what, can, what also happened was um, before that early 1990s time period, uh, the tank may have been taken out of service and they filled in the cap or re- rebuilt the sidewalk, and they took down that vent pipe because they didn't need the tank anymore, but the tank is still underground. And um, so a lot of times if we're in a neighborhood and it's a multifamily and I can't find any evidence of a tank, I'll still recommend a geophysical survey just based on uh, the probability that uh, based on the age of the building and the neighborhood that there might be a tank there, that there's no longer any um, physical evidence. And some some of the uh, tanks were installed uh, and permits were taken out at the time or permits get lost or misfiled, that kind of thing. 
And so we, we'd rather err on the side of caution. And, uh, so, uh, and it comes down to being as much a, an art as a science uh, in making that kind of the final decision on whether you're, you're going to recommend a $2,000 geophysical survey for this property. Um, but, um, you know, we've, we've taken, a, we've got a lot of experience with the neighborhoods in Portland and, and in greater Portland. So we feel like we're usually making a pretty good call when we recommend that. And ultimately it's pretty cheap insurance if you're buying a commercial or a multifamily building to, um, to spend a couple thousand dollars on a geophysical survey along with the whatever 2,500 you spent on the phase one to, um, to know whether you're buying <clears throat> someone else's environmental liability along with your, um, property. Oh yeah. And, and I want to go back here. You mentioned, uh, or I think you did decommissioned. Was there a, in, in, cause I, at one point, I guess what I'm trying to say is that that it did seem like I, I had heard uh, like a common practice where they would just kind of take off the uh, the pipes, drain you know, drain the thing, fill the sand, mm-hmm. you know, call it good, and be done with it. You know, yep. Nobody look here. There's nothing to see. Kind of a uh, mentality, mm-hmm. and, out of uh, sight, out of mind. <laughs> yeah, and I I don't know if there was any kind of a check off, uh, you know, prior to that. The, to to uh, confirm that there hadn't been a problem, or it was just like uh, more of a we're not using this tank, tank anymore. Uh, it's not in use. We've decommissioned it. Right. The um, like I mentioned before, if the tank was being pulled, then there was a uh, pre nineteen ninety one. There was a requirement for the contractor at least to pay attention to whether he saw gray soil in there or smelled the gas after he pulled the tank out and looked down in the hole and saw a bunch of discolored soil. So, um, you know, whether those contractors actually bothered to, um, dig the contaminated soil out is, was probably on a case by case basis. Some of them were probably more conscientious about that than not, but, uh, you're right in the, um, up until that time, the late 80s, early 90s, there really wasn't as much uh, environmental awareness on contractors or uh, on the uh, authorities, uh, either the fire marshal. They, uh, if a commercial tank was being removed, the fire marshal would send someone over there to kind of keep an eye on the uh, process because of the danger of explosions and uh, fire uh, that kind of thing with the larger tanks, the 20,000 gallon tanks you'll see at a gas station. Yeah. But for residential, a lot of times the, the pipes and the fill were just cut off and then um, they filled the tank in or they didn't even bother filling it in. They just, uh, you know, they just cut them off at the ground level and then kind of forgot about it. Um, what uh, that that it actually is still legal to uh, decommission a tank in place, but uh, the samples still have to be obtained. And the way that's usually done is that the contractor will dig down to the top of the tank and cut a hole in the tank. Then they actually put on uh, breathing equipment, go inside the tank, wipe it down, clean it out. This is actually all in the code uh, that. Uh, the uh, state environmental authority is, has on tanks. Uh, then they drill or cut a hole in each end of the tank. They're usually kind of an oblong shape. Uh, and then take soil samples from directly under the tank. So they'll, be, they'll cut this hole maybe uh, six inches in diameter and then use kind of an augering device to uh, drill down another six inches to a foot and grab a sample. It's usually about the size of a baseball or, or a, uh, a baby food jar, these uh, jars that we uh, put the sample in, send it to a lab. And if that comes out back clean or below a certain concentration, then the uh, contractor is allowed to fill that tank in with gravel or a um, 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 defined density fill material. And, um, and, and they get a letter from DEQ saying that they've done it properly and, uh, and that the uh, no further action has to be conducted at that site unless in the future somebody digs nearby and finds some pocket of contamination they always have a caveat at the end of their um their letters there that say like this is uh basically just for this situation as we know it now it doesn't mean uh they're, they're, that we wouldn't need to um uh, issue some kind of a uh, an update if uh future contamination is found 
Sounds like a pretty extensive process. How does it uh, price out compared to just the removal and? Well, so there's uh, there's kind of two different um, tiers of consultants in town. There's the folks that cater mostly to residential because it's kind of a uh, it's a larger market in terms of overall customer base uh, and the customer. But it's a um, the tanks are usually less expensive to decommission. Uh, but there's a lot more of those out there than, say, your commercial tanks, which would be your gas stations or your your fuel depots and those kinds of things. And so that, that's kind of the way. There's very few consultants that uh, do both um, because there's it, the clientele is so different and you're dealing with different realtors, too. And so uh, for residential tank, uh, say if you're buying a house in uh, Portland and you see that, a vent coming up the side of the house. Um, the uh, It's not required, but almost everyone has soil samples taken if they're buying a house because uh, it's so well known now that the, of the uh, potential. Even if a tank is still in active use, it might be leaking a little bit. Uh, and that's actually a fairly inexpensive process. They charge between, say, two and $500 to just uh, come in with these usually hand operated, almost like a post hole digger and come down and, and uh, take a sample at each end of the tank. First, they'll use a probe, maybe a magnetometer or maybe just a metal probe to uh, feel around in the ground and try to get the outline of the tank. And then they'll try to get as close as they can to each end of it. And then <clears throat> use these hand operated augering uh, devices, sampling devices to uh, go down till they're about a foot below the top of the tank, uh, below the bottom of the tank, rather. So that's usually six feet deep or so, seven feet deep. Uh, and they'll take a sample from each end, um, send it to the lab. If it comes out clean, you can keep using your tank and buy the house, and everyone lives happily ever after. Or uh, if it comes back contaminated but you're still using the tank, well, you still need to get that tank fixed. So... Uh, and the best time to handle that kind of a thing is before the house sells. So a lot of these tanks, uh, a lot of these replacements or decommissionings or conversions from oil to gas happen um, just before someone actually acquires the house. Right. Get that uh, clean bill of health rather than uh, mm-hmm. the eye of suspicion there. And um, then there's uh, a couple other items that are very common on that list too. Radon. Uh, a radon test is a couple hundred bucks. For a house, and they use uh, usually they use these continuous radon monitors and leave them for about 48 hours in the, uh, the basement of your house to uh, to check the levels of radon in the air. And if you're, I don't know if your listeners know what radon is. It's a radioactive gas that's naturally occurring. Uh, it tends to show up in volcanic soils, and we have a lot of it here in Portland because. Um, there were uh, some catastrophic floods that came down the Columbia Gorge after the last ice age at the end of that and brought a bunch of this uh, radioactive bedrock from the Missoula, Montana area uh, through Portland and kind of settled into these gravel beds under a lot of the residential neighborhoods. And uh, even though our local basalt bedrock doesn't have a whole lot of the uh, radioactive uh, gases in it, um, that those are rocks from the that Montana from the from the from the floods that have been transported down the Columbia Gorge do, and so uh, it it uh, it really is on a case by case basis. It's it's very difficult to determine the radon hazard of property without actually uh, taking samples. There's a lot of other conditions that contribute to it. How um, <clears throat> how thick your basement uh, slab is, whether there's cracks in it. Um, uh, what the um, whether there's silt right under there, just kind of um, that powdery, uh, real fine soil, or whether there's more gravelly soils will affect it, and uh, the elevation and, and actually um, weather conditions can affect it, uh, and then the individual characteristics of your house, uh, houses that are a lot more weather tight um, tend to. Uh, have less air kind of penetrating up through the basement slab than uh, houses where there there's uh, you know less weather tight and you've got a uh, kind of chimney stack effect where if you open a window upstairs that will tend to the heat will rise in the house and it'll tend to uh, cause a uh, 
depressurization underneath the slab in the basement, and uh, those those gases can come up through the cracks in the basement. So, so uh, an old drafty item. old drafty house has more chance of uh, the uh, gas coming up through the through yep. the uh, foundation. Yeah, and then just on a block by block basis, depending on the soil conditions, that can have a big uh, impact on the the uh, radon levels in the house. I mean, when the draftiness of a house also helps mitigate it because you've got more air flowing through the house, but it kind of depends on the, it can depend on just kind of the atmospheric conditions too, because as uh, the, uh, say as the pressure drops, when a storm's coming in, you'll have, you'll, that will cause air in the house to kind of escape as the uh, pressure drops outside. And uh, that can kind of tend to pull the uh, soil gases up through the, basement as well but the um, radon tests are about two hundred dollars for a 48 hour test so it's a it's really con, you know comparatively uh, very expensive uh, insurance to make sure that you don't have these uh, carcinogenic gases in your home uh, air you know yeah hey, what about uh, mold and asbestos do you get into that mm-hmm. at all we do asbestos surveys. We don't have a mold uh, technician on staff, uh, but uh, we do have uh, um, geologists trained in uh, doing an, an asbestos survey. And uh, the way that works is uh, first, you, um, first you have to get certified and go through the training to know what to look for. And then uh, we do a full inspection of the house and anywhere we see these materials that uh, look like they might be or that we consider suspect asbestos containing. We'll cut a half inch by half inch sample out, put it in a plastic bag, label it, bring that to a lab. And then, um, of course, you know, have a, uh, a catalog of all the, a list of all the materials and pictures and stuff to document it all. And then we'll uh, come up with a write up a report uh, based on the results of the, the, uh, the lab. And just because there's asbestos in a house doesn't mean it has to be removed. It just has to be in good condition or encapsulated. Um, but if it is in poor condition or if, uh, if it's in an area where it's likely to be disturbed, then uh, it's always a good idea to, to get it out of there. Got it. And you said mold. You guys don't, you don't get involved in that? No, we don't have a mold person on staff, uh, but uh, it is considered, uh, you know, an environmental due diligence uh, topic or issue, and uh, that tends to be considered more industrial hygiene, uh, and we've kind of uh, cut a line in our services there at industrial hygiene where we're not um, we're not really um, serving that market, but. Uh, you know, most residential property transactions include at least a visual assessment for possible mold. Gotcha. And if I do see that while I'm doing a phase one, I'll comment on it as a courtesy, but we typically don't uh, sample for that. Got it. Um, as far as the, the environmental assessment, um, do you recommend that People have one done for every property they're they're buying, or is there a line of? I mean, if you don't see the the vent pipe and and uh, I mean, I guess if you have like the certificates, you know, proving that it was disposed of or removed, and mm-hmm. and uh, but it, but if you short of a, you know a, a clean bill of health from um, some you know prior uh, efforts, yep. Would it would it be wise? I mean, it just seems like your your uh, liability uh, exposure is pretty big if you didn't have that. Sure. I mean, the general rule rule is if you buy contamination, you own it. Yeah, uh, there are uh, some situations. Usually, it's commercial or a larger property where uh, a past owner has had an insurance policy that uh, covered or didn't uh, explicitly uh, restrict uh, claims on environmental issues. And I haven't personally worked on one of those or seen a project 
come through our firm where um, a claim like that was made, but it's not it's not completely unheard of. Uh, but that's kind of a kind of, kind of sidestepping your question. Um, the uh, I would say for a residential situation, if you instead of doing a phase one, if you just have the the um, do your due diligence, looking for a tank, checking the records, um, uh, doing your radon survey, and uh, doing a visual for mold. Um, especially considering the fact that usually a tank, even if it's a big release for a heating home heating oil tank, we're usually talking in the five thousand dollar range for a cleanup. Maybe if it's impacted groundwater 10,000. So it's not something where, I mean, that's uh, the level of expense where it's usually not going to put too many people in the poor house. It may be challenging, but you could, a lot of folks can tap into a line of credit or something for that if right. they hadn't researched it. Uh, with a commercial property, uh, the, the way the lending institutions usually approach it is they have a, a million dollar threshold so they kind of have a, <clears throat> it's just a rule of thumb. If it's under a million, they don't necessarily require it. But I do think, I mean, I've certainly seen, uh, and I've certainly done a lot of phase ones for properties that were under a million. If it's a, uh, a very rural property and it's only, and you can, you can interview someone who's been associated with the pr property for a while, for maybe three or four decades, uh, and they can, and you believe them, you know, it, it comes down to, um, to interviewing people, knowing the right questions to ask, and then really assessing the, um, the character and believability of the person you're interviewing, uh, to, to decide if you, if it makes sense to, um, buy the property without an environmental assessment. But, you know, when you consider that it's, uh, Twenty five hundred dollars or so. It, it is relatively cheap insurance to have uh, to have the assessment done, and we've got contracts with some cities and some counties, and they usually just their policy is whenever they're buying land for a park, even if it's just bare ground, they'll have an assessment done on it. They're deeper pockets. They have uh, liabilities associated with people getting injured on their properties or getting poisoned. So you know, they're a lot more. Um, I guess, proactive about their due diligence than maybe someone who's just trying to buy a storefront to put in an ice cream shop or something like that. Um, they're more sophisticated. They tend to buy more properties <clears throat> and they're more experienced in that maybe they've gotten burned a few times because I, I have seen that where we've been called in after a municipality purchased a property that they uh, everyone in the department just kind of looked it over and, and thought, oh yeah, this is just a rural property. There's there's not going to be any problems with it. And then they, they did realize there used to be a farm, and yes, there was a tank there, and nobody knows exactly where. Or <clears throat> the farmer had a place where he dumped his tractor oil when he did his oil changes, <laughs> you know, back in the yeah, day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's really no way to know. And uh, without sounding mercenary, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's usually for the cost of, um, of doing an assessment, we actually include a lot of research and really um, uh, are pretty thorough about um, identifying any potential uh, liabilities at the property. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's, I, I encourage people to think of, about it as kind of an insurance. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, walk away from getting fire insurance. Sure. Uh, so, uh, well, it sounds like what I'm hearing you say, though, is that the banks are really the – once you get to the million-dollar loan size, they're going to demand that, mm -hmm. that that be, which makes sense. And, and uh, you know, for for a little bit of uh, cost, I'm assuming that even in, in the negotiations, um, you could probably have an opportunity to uh, split the cost or at least get, get some sure. relief from the, the seller on that just to uh, – uh, defray that or you know because the yeah. seller's going to be probably faced with that you know continuously until they they can prove mm -hmm. that it's not a problem so um yeah you know. sometimes they want to uh co-purchase the consulting or the phase one assessment uh so that they can also rely on it and if that 
first buyer walks away, then they have the environmental assessment that they can um, offer to the next buyer. Right. Uh, right. Or at least know that they them, they themselves know, you know, that uh, they've done their own due diligence. A lot of we, we that's not unusual for a seller to just call us and say, hey, I'm getting ready to, to sell this property and I want to know. You know, I've owned it for 20 years, but I never had to get a phase one on it back then. But uh, I don't want to sell somebody a, a property with some hidden environmental liability just because uh, I want to be upfront with uh, all aspects of the property. And um, so that's not, I wouldn't say it's the most common situation, but it's not that unusual where they're just one that, well, I want to do my due diligence as a seller. So sure. come on out and do a assessment. Yep. Sure. Have you had any uh, issues with any like drug houses or, you know, any kind of, uh, just trying to think of other, like, uh, seems like meth cooking was, uh, yeah, right. There's actually a, a county li- or a county by county list of all the houses that have been uh, identified as have those clandestine drug labs. So we do, uh, check that database when we're uh, doing any property. And uh, I personally don't, let's see, I've done about, since I've been on my own here, consulting for about 12 years, we've done about 50 projects a year. So we're in the 600s, something like that. I actually have not, to my knowledge, had a uh, um, house where I walked in and there were the telltale signs of a drug lab in there. Although I've been on some rural properties before where there are uh, just a pile of uh, contain, kind of unmarked containers and things where uh, that was suspected and we had to recommend that the uh, containers get moved and uh, some soil sampling be done right in that area. But I don't remember that actually resulting in uh, a cleanup. So uh, that is an issue, but uh, yeah, we haven't bumped into that um, do do you guys anyway, yeah. do you have to put on the suits and all that stuff, or you basically do the uh, the assessment and then whoever cleans it up? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of the, the big there's, yeah. There's four different levels of um, personal protective equipment that uh, can be required on a, a remediation site, and uh, our company policy is. Uh, only to um, gear up with level D, which is considered the the least severe type of protection. Level A is where you've got self-contained breathing tanks. You've got the full bunny suit uh, that's um, impervious to air and, and, and vapors and such. And then levels B and C are kind of gradually less uh, stringent, where you've just got these respirators with filters uh, and, um, you don't necessarily have to wear the, uh, the full body suit. Uh, and so just for our, uh, the level of insurance we have and the type of work that we've done, we just do the, the we don't enter into situations where we're going to need anything greater than that level D, which is basically steel toed boots, uh, long pants and, um, uh, a long sleeve shirt just to make sure that if there is any contamination on the ground, you're, we're, we're wearing sh- sturdy shoes and nothing like flip flops and you're not wearing shorts, that kind of thing. It's basically to keep your body covered. And then if you, if you do seem, seem some kind of uh, oddly discolored soil, you, you make sure you, you get those clothes laundered when you bring, get them back. It's also, we run it, we do a lot of, uh, rural properties that might have poison oak and other, um, you know, non hazardous material, but still uh, hazardous to your body type of, uh, yeah. situations where we'll, as soon as I get home, everything goes in the wash and I even wipe down my briefcase and my camera case and, and my shoes and stuff. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, you know, it just, uh, occurred to me, um, you ever have any issues with like restaurants? I was just thinking of the uh, the deep fat fryer tank uh, and some oh, of that yeah. stuff. Is that, is that ever? I've I've been into the kitchens of a few restaurants in town to do a phase one, and I kind of vowed never to eat there afterwards. But it was more like just their level of uh, housekeeping rather than any uh, any actual hazards, you know, contaminants, that kind of thing. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was uh, just curious if, if the <laughs> if the oil or the you know the deep fat fryer oil was mm-hmm. considered a, um, a hazard if it uh, you know breached the, yeah, no, that's, the tank or it's um, yeah they usually where you'll see that is either in the fry later itself or they'll have five gallon buckets of it sitting around in the kitchen or in the walk-in freezer and then they'll have this bin really gross stinky bin out in the parking lot next to their dumpster where all the used grease goes right and um, it's not on the federal or state lists it's not considered a hazardous waste it's considered a food waste and um, it does get recycled in fact a lot of that gets turned into biodiesel right Right. uh, where they render it and purify it and then it can get turned into a fuel but uh the uh state deq and the epa have these uh lists of chemicals that they consider to be uh hazardous problematic carcinogenic um they're divided up into various categories of toxicity and then they also have these remediation um, tables of all those chemicals. Uh, there's three or four dozen chemicals that are on these. They call them a risk-based uh, cleanup tables where if you're going to a gas station and you're trying to uh, clean the soil up to an acceptable level, uh, there's there's not only the gasoline itself, but there's uh, – benzene toluene ethyl benzene and xylenes and then sometimes that ethyl dibromide some of the gasoline additives those all have different cleanup levels uh according to the state and federal um tables cleanup tables and the uh the numbers are slightly different depending on what kind of a future or end uh use you're going to have for the property so if the gas station is going to get removed and a housing development is going to be put on there the um the soil has to be quite a bit cleaner than if it's just going to be another gas station or if it's just going to be uh, some other uh, industrial site. Got it. Got it. Um, kind of to wrap up here. Um, sure. Is there is there anything that you would? I'm just wondering how, how would you summarize? What, what would you encourage the uh, listeners to uh, be thinking of when they're buying a property if they're you know trying to kind of keep their eye out for a potential uh, environmental issue? Well, in fact, I, uh, I was thinking when I was setting up my website a few years ago uh, is uh, how could it be really useful for people who are maybe in the early stages of uh, pricing out a commercial property. Uh, and so I put together a, um, a due diligence tips and tricks, uh, three or four page um kind of cheat sheet of resources, basically the same thing we do, only um, uh, in, a, in a format where you could kind of go down this checklist and uh, just on your own, maybe spending two or three hours uh, on some government databases um, to, uh, to, eval- to do a kind of a first look environmental evaluation of a property, because most of the, the data that we pull together is publicly available. You know, we have the expertise and know what to look for when we're walking around on a property, but a lot of the research we do can and is done um, just by uh, people that are trying to uh, find out the, uh, the potential for the environmental concerns at a property. Um, the Portland Library and a lot of uh, municipal libraries have these old Sanborn maps in a digital format, and what those were were a uh, – they were a block by block um, maps of buildings, uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, that were originally established in the late 1800s and early 1900s by the Sanborn Map Company. And the whole purpose of those was to uh, help insurers, fire insurance companies, uh, price out fire insurance, kind of price out the likelihood of a building burning down. And so they'll say, they'll have all this information and little symbols on the maps showing what the, the old buildings were. Uh, made out of whether it was brick or wood or or um, cement or steel or whatever and then also whether there's tanks there what the building was whether it was a dairy or an old automotive uh, repair shop or something like that they'll usually and they came out with these every uh maybe 
decade or so for a while between like the 1800s and the late 1960s. And so those will often, you can download them from most libraries and those will offer a wealth of historical information at, over a period of maybe the last hundred years or so, you know, every couple of decades, say 1880, 1920, 1940, 1960. So um, that's a great resource. Uh, you, uh, the other thing to do is just go down to your uh, building department and ask for all the building permits. You can also go to the fire marshal's office and ask if there's any tanks. And uh, in Portland, some of that information is on our uh, city's property database. Um, and then you could take a walk around the building and look for those the vents. Uh, and then another really good source is often if there's uh, a neighbor that's lived in the neighborhood for several decades. Yeah, now you're usually talking. Be very, uh, willing, uh, usually be very willing to um, open up about what was in this certain storefront over the years. Uh, that can, in the r more rural areas, those can sometimes be your only source of information. So um, if I'm out, uh, and o Oregon certainly has a lot of rural areas, if I'm out in some uh, one of the more rural areas, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll think nothing of just walking up to a door and knocking on it, explaining what I'm doing. And um, and sometimes you're the one who has to say, okay, uh, I, I got to go. You know, I'll sit you down <laughs> and make you a cup of coffee and tell you all about the whole, the whole town. Right. And then there's a couple other sources um, – you can order historical air photos decade by decade from several sources. You can get them online. There's uh, the Army Corps of Engineers office has their own collection here in Portland, and uh, they actually have a really um, high level of service. They'll they'll blow up the, the photos, crop them for you, and email them to you if you just send them uh, your address. You know, so and that thirty five or forty dollars to have air photos going back to the 1940s in some cases. And the um, a gas station's really easy to pick out because they'll have that little uh, canopy sticking out over where the tanks were. So that's something we're always keeping our eyes open. And then last but not least, uh, Portland and most cities also have a collection of uh, reverse city directories. So they're phone books that are listed by address. And uh, a big part of, of, of trying to put together the environmental history of the property is just knowing what the occupancy was back through the years. Uh, as if it was a barber shop, probably not much to worry about. But if it was um, a machine shop or something like that, or a dry cleaner, much higher potential risk. So you know, those are some of the resources that we check. In addition to um, the EPA and the DEQ's list, and they have uh, they both have these facility profiler type applications on their websites where you can. Uh, uh, you can just query a property address and you can pull up all the uh, environmental information about not only that address, but you can you can set it so that it'll pull everything from a quarter mile or a half mile. So if you have the time and inclination, you can actually do uh, most of the work we would do, only it would take you probably twice as long and you might run into some dead ends or, you know, not, not be sophisticated enough to um, identify a liability that we would because we've done so many of these. But, yeah, people can do a lot of environmental research on their own. And if they're looking at a dozen properties and trying to narrow things down, um, spending a day or two kind of doing their own pre-phase one environmental research um, say, you know, will save them quite a bit of money and maybe help them make the right decision based on environmental issues. You know, they can rule out a few of those properties uh, and not spin their wheels on uh, trying to evaluate those because they'd rule them out for an environmental problem or potential environmental problem. Got it. Mike, where can listeners go if they'd like to uh, connect or learn more? Oh, sure. Uh, our website is aaiconsulting.com, www.aaiconsulting. And okay. our company is called Assessment Associates, Inc. So if they Google us, they'll, the, the website should pop right up. And um, our phone number's on there, so... Feel free to just uh, take a look at the website, download our free due diligence tips and tricks guide, uh, drop us an email, give us a call, and we'd be happy to help you. Our territory is Oregon and Washington, so if you're in either of those states, um, we pretty much consider the entire of, of both of those states our territory. So looking yeah. forward to helping anyone out, and uh, we're always willing to, to uh, chat with someone if they just have general questions. Uh, always happy to uh, try to help someone out if they have a question or two, even if they're not ready to uh, engage us for services.
Got it. Hey, Mike, I want to say thanks again for uh, taking the time to talk. I've uh, thank you, Darren. A, yeah, you bet. No, I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure the uh, listeners uh, will appreciate this. For uh, you know, when considering a, a potential uh, purchase, or or even if you're uh, looking to sell, and and there might be some issues uh, yep. there. So good, good, great, good stuff. And uh, with that, uh, for our listeners, uh, if you like this episode, don't forget to uh, like, share, and uh, you can also subscribe. And remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.